Hi and welcome to this week's Font Digital Industry Spotlight. This is episode number six and today we're going to talk about Google AdSense launching a new ad format, the growing role of analytics in marketing, Google's AMP stories and another one for Google, expanding actions on Google Assistant. So the first topic we're going to cover is um, Google AdSense launching a new type of format. Um, basically this is Google's AdSense platform introducing AI into the um, way that AdSense will serve ads across the GDN network. Um, How does this differ from the current AdSense implementation? It's, it's based on machine learning and um, what it'll do is it's, it's one piece of code that publishers are encouraged to put across the website and it helps them to monetize the space a little bit better because it's auto placement. Um, and the reason they've done this is basically to make interaction better for ads. So it's automatically choosing placements based on best performance. That's so what it's doing. Is yeah. this just web or apps or mobile desktop, everything? Uh, I'm, talking? Uh, I'm not too certain, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's just it's, it's simplifying the way that publishers can advertise and use and monetize this space. And I think they're reporting on quite substantial growth in, uh, in revenue uh, through published sites as well. I think cool. the yeah the main benefit is it, it saves time for publishers um, messing about and figuring out where they're going to place ads on the websites and this piece of code will basically identify the most relevant position for that ad to be served, which is effective for everybody. It's effective for advertisers. It's effective for publishers in terms of making money. Cool. So it's going to figure out which positions to put it in based on content in the page, or it's just going to blast it everywhere and then decide which one works best and then keep putting it there, or. No, it'll decide placement and frequency. Oh, okay. So obviously it takes into account machine learning and uh, obviously AI, AI and stuff and it'll figure out where to place it for best performance, so best interaction, whether that's a, I don't know, a click or a uh, Based on a hover. the industry that you're in, so when you set up your industry, so let's say in jewellery or whatever, and they've already been really successful putting jewellery ads in this place, well that sort of... Is that what you mean by machine learning? Yeah, possibly. I guess it'll read a uh, history of similar sites and performance of particular categories or things like that. I, I imagine it takes a hell of a lot into account that yeah. we probably won't ever find out, to be honest with you. But um, If it's cost efficiencies for advertisers, that's good, isn't it? Well, yeah, it, it benefits both parties, and I think the, <laughs> the main benefit for publishers is it's really simple to integrate. It's just one piece of code that you put on your page, you turn it on or you turn it off. Oh, so it's opt-in, it's not just taking over? Something you've got specifically opt into by adding some more code. Yeah, it's a well, yeah. type of ad format. It? It's an ad format that you choose. So, yeah, instead of agreeing certain deals with exchanges and things like that, you can just basically put this code on and say, yeah, I'm happy for AdSense to deliver the ads in these placements across my site. The only disadvantage of this is that, obviously, you, you lose a little bit of control when it comes to uh, ad showing in, uh, across your site. You don't want to, obviously, completely blast every ad placement because you're at, uh, your website will start looking a little bit messy and things like that. So it takes a little bit of control away from the publisher, which isn't great. Yeah, however, one of the key points is the, the, the reckon that it's going to provide a better user experience, which is kind of an underlying theme with everything that Google are doing at the moment. Um, so whether that means that if they deem it not a good user experience, they won't show it at all. Yeah, possibly. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, the second topic we're going to cover is the growing role of analytics in marketing. Now, um, analytics has been around for a long, long time. Um, I think the difference between now and, say, seven, eight years ago is that you can measure everything. Um, everything, pretty much, that a user can do online now can be measured and recorded. Um, I think it's something that's becoming increasingly important. I think it's something that um, big data is going to play a part in, AI is going to play a part in. Um, I think the ability to pull vast amounts of data down and actually tell a story from it um, is a lot more capable these days than what it used to be. Um, I think it's starting to become a niche within its own right, uh, especially in the marketing space. 
Um, I think the value that's held on the data that you can get hold of now shapes the majority of good marketers' strategies. Um, do you think this, this whole industry of analytics and marketing is just totally monopolized by Google at the moment? Or do you think there's still room for other, other providers? I think in a way it kind of creates more opportunity if a third party provider wants to come along and spin things in a different way. I think Google Analytics have monopolized it because they have a free platform for the most part, um, which is really comprehensive. So no, no people, even if they have got a third party in play, will not have Google Analytics in play just because it's yeah. free to set up. Well. Um, and because it's become an industry standard because it's Google, um, I think the the data which everybody's reading from is pretty much the same. I think yeah. they're talking in this sense, I think they're talking more about things like analytics attribution and things like that. So in, yeah. incorporating multi-channels, so offline and online, how do they match together and where uh, businesses should be putting the marketing budget and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, as we know, the you know the purchase journey now is far more complex than it's ever been. And you know, marketers in the past, they used to base everything on like a last click basis through marketing channels up till now. And I think people are realizing that there's a lot more that goes on in the run up to you know like a goal completion or a purchase, something like that, and it obviously incorporates offline, online, multiple touch points along the way that uh, eventually get get you to that end goal. Yeah. So I think people are just wondering now, you know, instead of blasting market, you know, spending say half a million quid on PPC every year, is that you know is that actually genuinely driving you all the value that it needs to be driving, or is there something else along? that purchase path that could be optimized completely separately from your PPC activity that would give you more value. Mm. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot more of that happening now where it's uh, um, an integrated approach between channels. I think the capabilities for things like in-store visits just give even more value to channels like PPC. I think historically, like five, six years ago, maybe you weren't able to do that. You weren't able to tie that up. So um, it just strengthens the the argument to run your PPC and then when you can tie that back to other channels, your organic, things like that, it's just invaluable. It's uh, it's becoming easier to tell the right story and if you're not tracking from the start then you're not going to be able to refine your strategy, you're not going to be able to make cost savings. It's just something that although it's be becoming or being deemed as a, a growing role of analytics, it's always been there, it's just being able to use it um, effectively and from a cost saving perspective, you can't do without it, in my opinion. I mean, it is a minefield as well. I mean, it's like the holy grail, isn't it? Being able to figure out yeah. what you know your customers are actually up to and what they engage with in between you know, first discovering you to actually purchasing something like that. The, the touch bases with so many different platforms and you know they'll read various uh, informational posts and stuff before they're confident with your brand mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Quantifying it, you know, piecing it all together is such a complex task now, but I think there's a lot more emphasis on, on that now, especially now there's more tools coming out as well that help to increase your, you know, your transparency on things like this now. I think that's why you'll see more of the you know, different uh, transparency and visibility vendors coming into play a little bit more over the coming years, I think, to just shed a little bit more light on, you know, what are the behaviours, what are people actually doing, how are they engaging with content, what is the determining factor in whether somebody uh, bounces, doesn't bounce, or, you know, completes a goal or a purchase. I think it'll definitely become more of a, um, a key talking point across marketing in coming years. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a, there's a point maybe two, three years ago where the data that was available through Google Analytics was almost commoditized by the marketing industry, whereby everything that was easy to understand and visible sessions, um, visits, things like that were just across the board in general, whereas now because of the capabilities of um, analytics, it's it's not a commodity anymore. You have to actually go in and you have to know what you're doing and you have to be able to tell the right story. Um, and like I say, I think it's just going to become more and more important. And as these analytics tools and vendors become more sophisticated, marketers are going to have to follow that curve. Otherwise, they're just going to get left behind. Yeah. I think they're, they're looking at completely different metrics and measurements now to what they did mm. five years ago in, in determining whether something's performing or not. You know, the, the, the evolution of that on its own is just a completely different thing. Now, we look at completely different metrics now to what we did yeah. before in terms of viewability and uh, scalability, 
things like that. There's just there's so many things, and it is a minefield. I do empathise with with brands, especially big data brands that are playing with like enormous, yeah. you know, um, buckets of data. It must be an absolute um, mammoth task to be able to figure out exactly what's going on. So now we're just going to talk about Google's AMP stories that they've just put into um, sort of beta or, or dev uh, recently. So this, as, as you can probably guess from the name, is pretty similar to AMP. So that's accelerated mobile pages. And what that what AMP is, is essentially Google's cache or Google's really quick loading version of normal articles on the web. Um, so Google have been pretty aggressive with AMP and, and I imagine it's going to be pretty similar with these AMP stories in that if you uh, provide uh, the integration to your site correctly, they will put you really up the SERPs so you'll get featured in this nice little box, get a nice little lightning bolt next to it um, and that obviously encourages you to click through because you know it's going to be a fast loading page and uh, you know people give up on stuff if it's text ages to load. So getting that confidence of what they click on is going to load up really fast is really effective. And you've probably seen this on, on Facebook too of their Internet Articles initiative. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, you basically stay in that platform and don't leave it. And because you're doing that, you, you know, the, the publisher, uh, the platforms love it because you stay in there and the, the users like it because you get a bit of speed too. So what Stories is, it's basically an extension to the regular AMP articles. And obviously everyone's heard this name Stories being banded around now. So you've seen it on Snapchat, Instagram, etc. cetera. Uh, same thing. So you've just got uh, a full page full bleed photo essentially and then you've just got multiple of those like slides almost like a slideshow um, it's just uh, it's basically just a javascript framework that helps you build that so there's some special markup that you build into your page technically um, you specify like an amp story um, and then you give it your slides and stuff and then it just helps you it just basically builds all the nav for you in terms of swiping across um, so it's, just, it's just really rich um, is this is this only accessible for like premium publishers at the minute? Then is it or is it right now? It's just in testing. Yeah, so there's, there's like a few is wired, and there's a few of us where if you go to the uh, URL, I think it's g.co slash amp stories. If you go there on your phone, you get like a mock up, like, like a mock up Google search. Essentially, type in wired or one of the other approved publishers that are testing it, and you can see what these look like at the moment. But yeah, it's pretty much as I described. If you've used Instagram or Snapchat and clicked for a story, it's pretty much exactly the same. I'd, I I'd disagree with it being compared directly to um, Instagram or Facebook stories. Why? Because I don't think it's I don't think it's the same thing at all. It's the same. It's not. It's not it doesn't have form. the capabilities, does it? It's. It reminds me of. I'm trying to find it now. I think Medium released something called Collections. Am I right? And that was a very very similar um, user experience, and it kind of looks like. It kind of looks like that. It's just full bleed photos that you swipe across. But it's, it's not direct, but it's not because it's not people have to search it? for it still. Usually when you're discovering pe things on Instagram, uh, say Instagram stories, you, you, know, you just you stumble upon it, don't you? You view somebody's story, whereas this is, this is search focused. You ser you're physically yeah. searching for a story. So if you're searching for something to do, I know. I mean, I think personally this is going to be targeted at publishers like TMZ or whatever, whether breaking Kim Kardashian news or whatever. It's going to appeal to the same type of audience where you're looking at that kind of content and you'll type it in in your search query and then you'll get your story and that, that audience will relate to it, won't they? They'll be like, oh yeah, story, I guess. There's, there's not a social element to it, though, is there? Like you can a, share it like a story. It's more like Facebook Instant Article or it's just a, a new format to yeah. AMP as well. I think the, yeah. the picking, picking back in off the name really I think the, the media thing, it's, not, it's not the same thing. Like say, you, when you... When you see somebody's story on on Instagram, you just you've just discovered it. You're interested in viewing it because it's there right in front of you. Yeah, you I guess do, what, you have to go out of your way and actually search for this. I guess what you're saying there is that you don't know what you're going to look at until you click on it with Instagram or Snapchat. Do you? you just see someone's profile picture? I might get a tiny, tiny little preview on some of the platforms. Yeah. So you don't know what you're looking at. You're just looking at it because you're interested in that person. Whereas here, yeah, you, you're coming and knowing what you're looking for. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I think the media have misreported on what it actually is. That's what I'm trying to get at. It's just another way of putting a, a news article across, yeah. essentially. So it's going to be great for really media-rich news articles, essentially, like I said, just slideshows. It's going to be great for those. Um, and like I say, if the audience is used to digesting content in this format, then that's the type of people that are going to click through. Yeah. But f they've got to be careful, Google, because same with AMP. If they shove it right at the top of the SERPs again, everyone's going to jump on it just, just so they get discovered. Dilution. Whatever content they're putting on. Yeah. So what people are going to use it incorrectly just for the discoverability factor. What are the performance and reporting metrics that we're going to be able to look at to be able to see if something's 
you know, doing well in yes. this format. Is there anything that we can... I haven't read anything about no that. There's no direct comparison, is there really? What do you compare it to? What does good performance look like? And well, what metrics do you look at to see if it's performing right? Well, you can pull up AMP into your analytics county now. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with AMP story specifically, but like say you might want to, uh, how deep do they get in the story metric, might you? See if you get to the end, uh, see if there's a big bounce rate. And view time, up. pretty much. Yeah, but if it's broken into 50 slides, view time of two minutes might only be like three slides, might so you might want like a, a depth type thing. It um, will be pulled into Google Analytics in exactly right, the same definitely. way as AMP is, and the code structure for implementing it looks like it's differentiated from the existing AMP. Yep. So you will be able to track it. I don't know how. They keep making up these um, basically other versions of HTML, other HTML AMP tags and stuff. Yeah. It's more stuff for publishers to get to grips with. It's just another mm. another format. And then Google shove it at the top at SERPs and everyone does it anyway. It's like, you've got, you've got your bite dangles on there really for stuff like this. Monopolising. Yeah. If they, yeah. They can put whatever they want out and if it goes to the top at SERPs then people do whether it's good or not. So yeah. It's not a... Uh, it's just another thing. It's annoying for developers, <laughs> me. So yeah. <laughs> it's another thing to code, isn't it? Hopefully, um, the big platforms, WordPress and Shopify, etc., etc., and all the other blog platforms will put out plugins or enable it in their existing plugins that deal with AMP to spit out this stuff automatically. But I guess CMS is like figure out a way to sort of give content managers an easier way to sort of say, oh, slide one, slide two, slide three. Um, it'll yeah, get, it'll get more widely adopted when it comes into public. Yeah. It looks think, fairly polished. There's much longevity in these kind of things because it seems to just appear. I know it has been around for some time now, but yeah, like things with the, the obviously the stories, it's a little bit more niche in it, really. Yeah, I think it's only going to attract a certain type of person, but it'd be interesting to see how long it sticks around for before Google go and uh, yeah. I think they'll be quite selective about what verticals they push these results in, like Jay was saying with. Wired um, recipes and, and stuff where you've got a process to follow, be pretty good context for it. Yeah, there'll be verticals that work like publishers, tech, food, where they'll show it like they do with AMP. Anything that's got a step by step process would be great, no, like, like a recipe because you, you want big pictures, don't you? You want, you want step one, two, three, four, that'd be pretty good. But yeah, te tech articles, I don't know, like, what, why wouldn't you want a slideshow for that? It's just a bit more engaging, isn't it? If you've got a reporter going to CES, for example. Yeah, see, that's a bit different because you might be showcasing uh, a photo of a new product, something like that. But yeah, for something, if you've got an article about Google Assistant or whatever, so you don't want to read that in a story, do you? Do you want to read anything in a story? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> kids do. That's how kids digest stuff nowadays. The final thing we're going to talk about is Google making actions for its assistant um, available to more developers. So much in the same way that they do or they did with um, making Android open source and things like that. Um, they're bringing this assistant technology, opening it up to more developers in a, in probably in a direct attempt to compete with Amazon's Alexa skills. Um, it just means that developers are going to have a bit more access um, and a bit more capability in terms of working with it and bringing new features into the platform itself. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty predictable move, but it's quite it's quite a big thing, I guess, in terms of Google Home. What what type of uh, installation percentages are we looking at with Google Home in comparison to Amazon Echo? I don't know. We need to find some stats on We've that. We've got to be talking a pretty massive swing in Amazon's favour. I bet Amazon are 95% yeah. plus of the market. It's got to be, hasn't it? I so, thought so. People are no. incentivized really to get a Google Home at the minute. There's not enough stuff that's compatible with it, really. Mm. There will be, obviously, over the next six to 12 months, I'll, you're going to see an increase, aren't you? But I think people who want technology now and they want it to in integrate with like the home products and things like that, the natural thing is just to go, go for a, an Echo, isn't it, really? Yeah, and there's also the wider uh, considerations, I think, is one, Amazon will first market by, by miles. Yeah, two um, years. And two, it's, if you go on Amazon.com and type in speaker, it's like, yeah, just such as fog your echoes. And how many people are on Amazon every day? So, yeah. same with like Chromecast. How hard is it to buy a Chromecast? You have to pretty much go to Google Direct or, or Argos. If you go on Amazon and type Chromecast, didn't they get penalised? Someone told them Yeah, because yeah, they just wedged Fire Stick at top. Yeah, so, so you can't, no, one, no one knows about these Google products. Yeah. Uh, consumer, they don't really market them that much. I mean, did they have the TV campaign for Google Assistant or Google? Uh, yeah, the Google Home. Yeah, they've had the Google yeah, Home. They've yeah. had the, the, one, TV the, campaign. the one interesting thing about this being opened up is Google have got Assistant built into your phone. 
yeah. they've got it built into now you get like your tickets or your hotel bookings flights things like that um, and the ability to have that on your Google Home and then on your phone, it sort of integrates. So I think that's a bit of leverage at Google's favor because I know Alexa's a bit disconnected when it comes to, once you leave your house, you pretty much leave your Echo and your Alexa behind. Yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. Google is sort of making a play here for this to be integrated in a way which allows you to just consistently be connected to this device or to this platform. Um, which I think is an interesting thing because you can then be at home, book a Uber, it'll then send your ticket directly to your phone or, or a similar sort of mechanism for how it would operate. But I think it's it's going to enable it to be a lot more integrated, um, which I think will make a lot of people take notice as opposed to... Does this anyone do that with, with uh, an Echo though? Can you not? I think you can. Like but a ticket and then that obviously push that into your, your calendar or something like that and yeah, give you the same I, data set. I just don't think um, Amazon plays nicely with Android. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's getting these new devices now and these new essential service offerings need to integrate with the rest of the ecosystem that's under that brand's control really well. That's why Amazon are killing it with Prime because that, that subscription now gets you so much stuff. And it, it almost seems like, just think about it now, I don't know what you get with your Echo with Prime. Do you get any perks or anything chucked in by having well, a Prime membership? It's all yeah. like Prime, do you get music or something? Yeah, like you've got, there's music, there's Prime video, so you, and you can now control your Fire Stick through your Echo, so you could say to Alexa, play Game of Thrones on my Fire Stick and it'll do it straight through, mm. and you don't have to mess around. They're all going to be looking at these avenues that the way they can get, you know, bring the tech together that they've already got mm. to mm. make it a little bit more attractive to people. That's weird. Uh, that, that's a really key move, I think, in terms of what they've done yeah. there because they, they know that most people are going to, you know, notice that benefit if it is, like it's saying here, giving, you know, pushing notifications to your Google apps and mm. it's, it's where it is wherever you need it, when you need it type thing. Like you say, when you leave the house with your, with your Echo and stuff, you're pretty much out the window. Yeah, right? yeah. so, so I think that, that's what they're angling for. They're, they're looking for the other integrations and technologies that they've got to take advantage of. Well, there's a lot of plays that Google have been working on with the assistant that people are sort of not taking too much notice of, like the fact that Android Auto is in your car. You can do voice search. You can control your sat nav through your voice. It's on your phone. It's now going to be on a home device. So you're literally going to be in Google's pocket the whole time, from falling asleep to waking up. When we're talking about hardware and software being combined and being like shot traps in the ecosystem, don't, this is going off topic a bit, but don't you think Spotify is a massive outlier here? Because they haven't got an exclusivity or anything or a partnership necessarily with anyone. They just sort of, there's all these companies trying to lock people into software that are selling hardware that essentially plays music, one of the main functional pieces of functionality because they've all got speakers on. And none of them have got uh, a great or perfect or like USP integration with Spotify. And it's sort of, same with cars and stuff, is like, I think that's quite strange how Spotify I, think that I still don't understand why no one's bought Spotify though it's weird it's very weird I think from a total like ecosystem point of view because obviously Google have got a music service Amazon have got a music service Apple have a music service and none of them can compete with Spotify but Spotify don't sell hardware and don't have an exclusivity of any hardware vendors they work with everybody that's, because they, 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 that's their product focus product, 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 isn't it? I think if one of these guys if Google or Amazon dedicated enough time and money to that as well they could they could probably take over it but I don't know could they seems like they've already good go Spotify got yeah, there first got, got reputation thing. you know it's been there for so long convincing people to move away from Spotify now when they've been on it for I mean I think I've been on it for about a good four four years probably well your music's personal as well isn't it when you set playlists up and do things I ain't, I ain't going Spotify I've got zero ties to Spotify I haven't got any playlists or anything like that well you maybe you're unique but I, don't, but I won't have any need. I've never thought, oh, I'm going to move to Apple or Google. I just don't understand it. If Google bought Spotify, that'd be instantly a leg up over Amazon because they could just stop any connection with uh, Echo. Simple. Mm. I think that, I, I find that strange. But I do find, that's what I said, I thought things were strange that, that no one's had got an exclusivity or anything. I think Spotify's just waiting. will do it. I think it's just a, a, a brand loyalty thing at the minute. People know Spotify and like you say, the... It, it has all the music in there that they probably had there sat there for years in playlists that they just the they just don't want to move off. I wouldn't want to do it if I had say thirty different playlists that you know I access quite frequently. 
it'd, they'd have to have a pretty convincing case for me to want to leave and subscribe for the same amount of money possibly. But the, the only way that they'll be able to do that is if they have the same library and they'll never get the same library because Spotify have got um, agreements in place with a lot but, of the But labels. it's pretty close, isn't it? I mean, if you try and compare it to, we're going even further off topic here, video um, on-demand services. So Netflix obviously got Netflix originals now, you've got Prime originals. They've actually got their own library. It's like, if you move, that's it. You're cutting off them ones and you've got these ones. Whereas the music providers, they're all, they've all got the same library, basically. Mm. There's a couple of exceptions, but there is I'm sure if it. Google or Apple or Amazon wanted to, they could pretty much get the rest of them clean, cleaned I'm up. I'm sure Google or Amazon wanted to buy Spotify, they could, but for some reason they're not. I wonder if there's a, a legal stance on that, why it's just, they're just not allowed to buy them, because it's be too much of a monopoly over these services. Well, I think that could be the case. I think it's probably the most used platform between these home devices, yet yeah. if one tech giant owned it, they own the market very mm. much, don't they? I bet, I, mean, I, bet that, I bet that has come into I bet they've had a go at doing this. Someone must have. Google will have. Think. Look at iTunes, though. That's, you know, that's... How long did that take to die out, really? That, that was like a legacy things. product, though. They were just around for so many years, and there were no other competition, really, in the market against that, and that that's stuck around for God knows how long. But iTunes it? was buying digital music, wasn't it? That was the thing that it did. I mean, obviously, it does other things, too, because it grew into a bit of a... A bit of a beast in it, but yeah, iTunes was where you went to buy music online, wasn't it, for a time? But then the streaming service came along, and no one buys digital music anymore, do they? Yeah, but the point that I'm trying to make is people have a really strong affinity to these uh, platforms where obviously all your data is stored. It's personal, it's like personal information that you just don't want to move away from. I think they'll have a bigger struggle with that getting people to onboard onto their new services. But iTunes has got a hard tie, hasn't it, as well, to the hardware, so you can't obviously can't run iTunes on Android. This is going off topic. <laughs> so Google's, Google's making actions available for more developers. Hi right, guys, thanks for watching episode six. If you like what you saw, um, get in touch, start a conversation, um, or if you've got any suggestions for a topic you want us to cover, um, please send it in and we'll get on it. Bye. Air conditioning.